I feel the touch of God in this house. Amen. I feel his presence and his purpose here. We're going to take our needs before the Lord. We're going to continue to pray for Ralph Preston and Patrice Sheridan, Brother Bigelow, Brother Hudson, a young lady by the name of Summer that is battling cancer, a need in the Sullivan family as well. How many of you have a need in your life tonight? You just need God to touch you. Let's call on the name of the Lord on these needs right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, uh, you're able to do exceedingly and abundantly above everything that we ask or think or expect. Uh, come on, church, pray with faith. Don't pray out of need. Pray out of faith tonight. Uh, we are praying with faith in our hearts, believing that you are able to do all of these. Uh, I'm asking you, Lord, to begin and complete the work in every one of these needs. Uh, touch Ralph Preston and Patricia. Sheridan, God. Uh, pray for Brother Bigelow. Bring health to that man of God's body. Uh, pray for Brother Tommy Hudson. Let your work be done in that life and bring strength to that family. Uh, we bind and rebuke cancer in the life of summer right now. Uh, you see the need in the Sullivan family. Uh, I'm asking you in the name of Jesus to reach down and minister to these. Uh, in the name of Jesus, uh, every need that was represented in this house tonight, uh, I'm asking you need to minister personally to it. Uh, bring direction and guidance, I pray. Bring strength and healing. Uh, bring a peace of mind. Uh, I pray before this night is over that everyone that is in this house, uh, your presence would minister to them in a very special way uh, and uplift them and uphold them with your grace and your presence. Uh, in the name of Jesus, uh, bless your name. Heaven's heard our prayer. You ought to give him praise right now. Uh, hallelujah. 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 Uh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Make you aware of our announcements for the rest of the week. Just found out about this Thursday, Friday, and Saturday there is a men's conference. Brother Wiley's church is hosting. Brother Jerry Wayne Dillon will be preaching if you're interested in going to that menu, are more than welcome to do so at Worship and Word. Friday night, youth prayer. Prayer makes all the difference in the world. Amen. Transform will be praying at the youth convention April 7th, 8th, and 9th. Brother Cotter is going to come lead us in worship. As he does, come and give of your tithes and offering. If you want to give via the square, you can see Rihanna right over to my left. God bless you tonight.
Oh, sing better is one day. Oh, better is one day. Oh, better is one day. In the court countenance. Sing better is one day. In the court better is one day. In the house. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I text for you, Jesus? For in all of you be still. Will I stand in your presence? Or to my need will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak it all like an only a man time? Oh. Oh, surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Oh, and all of you be still. Will I stand in no presence? To my knees will I fall? Will I see hallelujah? Will I be able to speak it all like an old Oh, I can only imagine. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Lord, all of you be still. Will I stand in your presence? To my need, will I fall? Will I see? enemy has been defeated and death couldn't hold our God down. Gonna shout and lift our voice in victory. Yes. Yes, we're gonna make it. We're gonna lift our voice. Hallelujah. And death couldn't hold you down. God, gonna lift our voice in victory. Gonna make your praise and loud. The enemy has been defeated. Lord, death couldn't hold you down. We're gonna in victory, we're gonna make your praise. Enemy has been defeated. Oh, death couldn't hold you down. Gonna lift our voice in victory. Gonna make your praise loud. The enemy, oh, death couldn't hold you down. Gonna lift our voice in victory. Gonna make your that's why we sing. Son of the God with the voice of fire. Son of the God with the voice of praise. Son of the God with the voice of. Oh, we lift the name up. We lift the name up. Son of the God with the voice of fire. Son of the God with the voice of praise. Yes, we lift the name up. We lift the name up. Son of the God with the voice of fire. Son of the God. Somebody 
shout to the God when the voice shall triumph. Somebody shout to the God with the voice of praise. determined so you ought to lift your hands and lift your voice and shout for victory all over this house I bless you oh God hallelujah 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 thank you Lord Jesus thank you Lord Jesus man I'm glad I came to church tonight I'm glad I came in ready to have church tonight thank God for his presence amen let you be seated tonight. We're going to get into the word of the Lord. I do not have a text of scripture to read to you at the beginning, but we will be referring to scriptures throughout, throughout this lesson. I don't know if we will get all the way through this tonight or not. I began working on it today, and it just got larger and larger, where I usually have between seven and nine pages of notes. I have 15 pages of notes tonight. But don't fret, don't worry. I believe the Lord's going to talk to us. I asked on Sunday how many people have been fighting distractions. And there was a number of hands that went up, so I know I'm on the right path with this. And one of the reasons I know is because I've been distracted in my mind. And usually whatever's going on in my mind ends up going on in the congregation as well. Just the way it works with the, with the role of the shepherd in the church. And so I'm going to be teaching tonight on... Distract. Well, I wonder where I'm going to go to church tonight after service to eat. So you all miss that completely. I'll be teaching about distractions tonight. Now, before I die, we dive into this, I don't want you to think the pastor's going on a rant about social media, about cell phones, and on and on and on. I'm not. That is the least. That can be a distraction. But that is the least of what I'm talking about tonight. I'm talking about distractions the enemy puts in our mind that we can't shut off. That just keeps rolling and rolling and rolling. That's what I'm going to talk about tonight. Let's lift our hands and ask that God would open up all our hearts, help us to be focused and not distracted, and that His Word would do a work in our life tonight. Father, I love you. I thank you for the presence of God and the people of God that have gathered I'm asking you to help us tonight, uh, help us to glean principles from your word and the examples that you have, you have shared with me through the word, uh, that we may glean from them and apply it to our lives and get our focus back in you. Uh, we give you thanks and praise for it, anoint me to speak your word, and only that, uh, discipline my heart, mind, and soul to speak only what you've shared into my spirit, uh, nothing more, nothing less. We give you thanks for it in Jesus' name, and everybody said Amen. I'm not certain if this is going to be put together in the most orderly fashion, so hopefully we can make some sense of it. It's just sort of how it was poured into me. There's a very popular term in driving instruction schools and in traffic stops today. It's the phrase distracted driving. Is anyone familiar with that term? Distracted driving is any activity that diverts attention from driving including talking or texting on your phone, eating and drinking, 
talking to people in your vehicle, fiddling with the stereo entertainment or the navigation system, anything that takes your attention away from the task of safe driving. It is a distraction. You've heard the story about the man who said, man, I'm so frustrated about all these people on their cell phones while they're driving. The lady was driving next to me, and she was on her phone and swerved into me, and I had to throw my hamburger and Coke down to grab the wheel so I wouldn't crash. Some of you are starting to wake up a little bit now. It's distractions. And we automatically identify distracted driving with the advent of the cell phone. But distracted driving was going on a long time before that. A billboard, people watching, on and on. Anything that takes your attention from what you should be doing would be distracted driving. However, in this day, texting is the most alarming distraction. We think it's not the major. I'm going to send or receive a text. It's only going to take five seconds of my time what could happen in five seconds of my time. But studies have shown that if you are driving at a speed of 55 miles per hour and you are distracted for that five-second minimum period, that's like driving the length of an entire football field with your eyes closed. That's a distraction, a major distraction. I know of an individual, you would think this would be a safe place to be distracted. She's cutting through an empty parking lot. No cars, no traffic, no traffic signals. She gets distracted by her phone, is fooling with that wide open parking lot and runs into a huge parking lot light. Seemed like the safest place to be distracted, but yet it happened. You say, well, it's just three seconds or five seconds. It's nowhere near as dangerous as a DUI. Can I tell you the activity you engage in while driving, it may seem harmless compared to a DUI, but the consequences can be just as deadly from a distraction as it can be from a mind-altering substance. Distraction is legally defined as a thing that prevents someone from giving full attention to someone else. A distraction would be anything that would keep you from listening to pastor teach tonight. It's a thing that prevents someone from giving full attention to something else. I like the second de definition. And this is where I'm keying in to where we live today. Extreme agitation of the mind or emotion. It's that thing that gets in the mind, and it's like the agitator on a washing machine, and it's going round and round and round, and it's agitating the mind, it's agitating the emotion, and it just won't go off. Distractions are dangerous. We understand the danger of distractions in the natural with the reference to distracted driving. In 2020, 3,142 people were killed in motor vehicle crashes involving distracted drivers. However, this is not a driver training course. I highlight that to say that as it is in the natural, so it is in the spiritual. The Apostle Paul understood the danger of distractions when he wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6, Verses 1 through 14. I'm going to first read what he wrote to you and then give you the context of it and why he wrote that. He wrote in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 1 through 14 to Timothy. Follow along with me in your Bible if you have it. Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. And they that have believing masters... Let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. Verse number three, he starts talking about distractions. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, that man is proud. He knows nothing but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, 
perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, all these distractions, from such withdraw thyself. But godliness, Timothy, with contentment is great gain. We brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they were distracted. They erred from the faith because they were distracted over the love of money, pierced themselves through with many sorrows. He gives all these distractions and warning about it. And then there is a change in the tone here in verse 11. But thou, O man of God, flee those things, everyone say flee, and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, that thou keep, everyone say keep, keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Timothy had been trained well when Paul wrote to him. Timothy had sat at the feet of Paul. He was considered one of Paul's sons in the gospel. He had been personally trained for ministry by Paul. It doesn't get much better than that. However, his personality, he was timid by nature. He was not the one to boldly speak out. He was not the one to be confrontational. Paul recognizes this personality trait in Timothy, and he warns him, Timothy, if you're not careful, you're going to be distracted. I'm writing to you to avoid distractions. This entire passage leading up to verse 10 and 11 is, is, is Paul's command warning Timothy of distractions. He tells them, be aware of false teachers. It's a distraction. Do not engage in the doting questions that, that come to naught. It brings strife and envy. It's a distraction. Do not get caught up in the distraction, Timothy. That gain is godliness. Uh, don't get caught up saying, well, the church down the road is making all kinds of money. Maybe we're doing it wrong. It is a distraction. Withdraw from that mindset. Do not fall into the snare of being rich. It's a distraction. Do not love money and err from the truth. It's all kinds of warnings and admonitions uh, to avoid distractions. And then verse 11 marks a transition from the distraction. It's not a warning, but now it's a command. I've told you about the warnings, but now thou, O man of God, flee these things. Flee the distractions and focus or follow after righteousness, godliness, love, faith, patience, and meekness. Then verse 12, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Profess a good profession before many witnesses. Verse 14, keep this commandment. In a nutshell, Paul is telling Timothy, do not allow distractions to keep you from doing what you should be doing. Why such strong admonitions from Paul to Timothy? Paul is warning Timothy in light of what's going on with Demas. I just read the the warnings from 1 Timothy, Paul records the demise and the, and the, and, and the desecration or when the, the desertion of, of Demas in 2 Timothy. While the warning to Timothy is in 1 Timothy and the demise of Demas is written in 2 Timothy, no doubt Paul saw the warning signs in Demas' life. Demas had all the right connections Colossians 4 tells us he was a companion with the Apostle Paul. Philippians, I'm sorry, Philemon chapter 1 calls Demas a fellow laborer of Paul. He was in the right group. But somewhere along the line, Demas became distracted from the work of God with a love 
for the world. How do you fall in love with something? You become attracted to it. You get distracted from this and attracted to that. And somewhere along the line, he became distracted until Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 4 and 10, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Demas had all the right opportunities. He had all the right connections. But Demas is a testimony of distraction by distraction. Let me say that again. It's a testimony of destruction by distraction. And Paul is warning Timothy as Demas is on his way out. This is in the front of Paul's mind. He is fearful for Timothy unless Timothy is destroyed as well. Timothy is no greater than Demas. And none of us are any greater than anyone else. If you see a person fall, don't say it never could happen to me. It's happened to the best of us, and it could happen to any of us. Uh, Timothy was no greater than Demas. He was a fellow laborer of Paul's, just as Demas. Uh, and Paul was concerned that Timothy would become comfortable with the rich heritage that he had. He was third-generation apostolic. It started with his grandmother and then his mother and now Timothy. He had been personally trained uh, sitting at the feet uh, of the apostle Paul, a son in the gospel. Uh, he had a rich heritage. Uh, Paul was concerned Timothy would get so comfortable with his heritage and the training he received, and he'd become distracted and eventually destroyed because distractions are dangerous. Let's look at the ploys of the enemy. John chapter 10 and verse 10 states that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. You ought to know this verse. That is the mission of hell. I'm going to steal, I'm going to kill, I'm going to destroy. And hell is good at its mission. And hell will use whatever ploy it can to fulfill this mission. This is simply from my own life observations. I'm convinced the two biggest ploys of the enemy to steal a person's walk with God are number one, offenses. I don't know one person who backslid from the church and said, I didn't like the speaking in tongues. They didn't say, that, did, that said, I didn't like the exuberant worship. It always goes back to an offense that they allowed into their life. I believe more people backslide over offenses uh, than anything else in the world. And I've taught extensively on that from the bait of Satan. I believe the second ploy of the Satan, the first is offenses. I believe the next that he used most often is that of distractions. Because if the enemy can't offend you, he will do his best to distract you. If he can't get you with an offense that drives you out, uh, he'll get a distraction in your mind that causes your walk with God to suffer and to weaken until you're not walking and then you're falling away from the things of God. I'm going to date myself a little bit. Does anyone remember the days pre-social media where if you saw a cute or inspirational story, it would made the circuit via email. Remember opening your email and there were all these warm chicken soup for the soul emails? Yeah. My dad would receive those emails and then print them all out and file them in case his computer ever crashed. He had a computer this big and a file cabinet. And I'm going to date myself and go back. And I greatly condensed it because I did not want to hold you hostage tonight. But there was a, I wouldn't call it warm, fuzzy email, but it's back in that day. Talking about Satan and distractions. This is not scripture. This is just someone putting pen to paper. They said, it is said that Satan called a worldwide convention. And in his opening address to all his evil angels, he said, we can't keep the real Christians from going to church services. We can't keep them from reading their Bibles and knowing the truth. We can't even keep them from holding godly values. But we can keep them from forming an intimate, abiding fellowship with Christ. This is most critical for our cause. For they have, if they have intimate, abiding fellowship with Christ, then we can have no power over them and no chance of gaining strongholds in their lives. Therefore, my evil comrades, this is what I want you to do. Distract them. And I would say hell has done a great job at distracting the people of God. There's a plethora of options to keep you distracted today. 
And I could get distracted right now and go off about all the time wasting distractions. That is not the point of my lesson tonight or, or into the next week if we have to go into that. The danger to a soul. Remember the two, the two ploys of Satan. Offenses or distractions. Remember those? The danger to a soul is just as real if it be an offense or a distraction. It doesn't matter which one. Both will pull you from your walk with God. Both will cause you to be lost. It's very similar to the, to the analogy I gave of distracted driving in a DUI. It matters not if it's a DUI or if it's a distracted driver. Both can bring death. It doesn't matter if it's an offense or if it's a distraction in your mind that's going out of control and agitating. It, it can be a detriment to your soul. Because remember, the enemy's aim is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. So let's talk about the sources of distraction. I want you to take your finger. I want you to point it to the person next to you and say, you are not my greatest source of distraction. And I want you to bring it right back to yourself and say, a great source of distraction is me. We've got to figure out the source of the distraction before we can deal with the distraction. Many of the distractions we encounter are self-imposed. My homework is due tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. And I've known this for two weeks. But I've been distracted playing pickleball. I've been distracted going to the mall. I've been distracted on social media. And now, now I, am, I am stressed out. It's Wednesday night. My homework is due Thursday morning at 7 o'clock. I must miss church on Wednesday night to get my homework done. Can I tell you that was not a distraction from the devil? That was a distraction from you. Or the person that has out of control debt. They've gone and maxed every credit card out they have. They're living paycheck. They're getting paycheck loans to meet the needs and the bills. It's out of control debt. There's great stress upon them. Can I tell you that distraction is not from the devil? It's from yourself. Or that smart device we keep picking up when we should be doing something else. Or neglected chores and responsibilities until we're overwhelmed with what needs to be accomplished. We are really good at distracting ourselves from things we do not want to do. When we don't want to do something, we can always find something better to do and talk ourselves into it. We find an example of self-imposed distractions in the story of Jesus when he went to the home of Mary and Martha. Jesus is coming to visit their house. You know how it is when you're expecting company. The special towels are put out. The special silverware is put out. And you don't dare touch it. You don't walk across the living room or else you're going to mess up the carpet lines. You know, the straight lines, no one has carpet anymore. But when you did, you vacuumed it so it looked like Chase Field before the World Series. You had it looking just right. And Martha is preoccupied with making sure the house is perfect and dinner is amazing. That's a worthy endeavor to be caught up in. It needed to be done. Jesus knocks at the door. Mary lets him in, sits down at his feet, and she is hanging on every word that Jesus says. And Martha is cleaning and she's cooking. And then she's cleaning loudly and she's cooking loudly because she is frustrated. And finally, she can't take it anymore. And she approaches Jesus, and she says, Jesus, uh, don't you care that Mary's leaving all the work for me to do? Can you get her to help me out? Look at how Jesus responded in Luke 10, 41 through 42. Martha, Martha, you are careful and troubled about a lot of things. But one thing is necessary. Mary's chosen the good thing. And I will not take it away from her. Martha was distracted by necessary things. Say necessary. It was necessary to get dinner ready for Jesus. It was necessary to make sure the house was clean. But she allowed those necessary things uh, to become a misaligned priority. It became more important to have everything perfect uh, than it was to sit at the feet of the perfect one. She allowed... Uh, the necessary things. It probably stemmed from her personality. She was a detail-orientated person. 
And our personality will uh, cause us to be distracted at times. Uh, and she was distracted by the necessary things, uh, and she missed out on the most important thing, uh, sitting at the feet of Jesus. Uh, can I tell you, uh, sometimes self-imposed distractions, uh, they are necessary things, uh, but we misalign them in our priorities, uh, and we miss out on the most important thing. Uh, here's the principle from that. Never, everyone say never. Never allow the necessary or the urgent to take the place of the important. When we come into the house of God, I know we can look over and say, man, we got three light bulbs that need to be changed and this and that. Don't pull the ladder out while we're worshiping Jesus to start changing light bulb. You're missing the most important thing. Never allow the necessary and urgent to take the place of the important. So, number one, a source of distraction can come from ourself. Okay? The second place distractions can come from is from hell. Daniel 7 and 25 states that in the end time, the enemy will wear down the saints of the Most High. He is speaking of things to come, but I believe he's already using this ploy today as well. You understand from the story of Job, he cannot touch you without permission from God. He cannot touch your health. He cannot touch your life without permission from God because you're covered in his blood. But if he can get in your mind with distractions uh, and weary the mind with tension and uncomfortable situations, uh, he will wear you down. That's called mental stress. That's why Scripture says we must cast down imaginations. Where, where, where's that distraction going on? It's going on in my mind, and my imagination is spinning out of control. And so I must cast down imaginations and every hide thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. If the devil can mess with your mind through distractions, he will do it. That's why we have to continually cast down the imaginations. I refuse to be wearied in my mind by distractions from hell. Instead of allowing my imagination to spin out of control, I will think on these things from Philippians 4 and 8. The things that are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, good report. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. And so hell is going to attack your mind and put distractions there and we must cast down the imaginations. We've got to understand the purpose of distractions from hell. Number one, we understand hell's purpose. Again, I'm going to recap. It is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And number two, it is to wear down the saints of the Most High. But that does not answer the question. I'm going to get to where we're living right now. Is this okay? I'm going to get to where we're living right now. Why am I under the attack with distractions? And to understand this and bring encouragement to you, I don't want you just to understand it. I want you to leave here encouraged tonight. Let's look at the ancient city of Babylon and its attack on the people of God. Babylon was the greatest city of the ancient world empires. It was an evil city. Its roots were evil as well. Babylon found its beginning in Genesis chapter 10, verses 8 through 10, and it is evil. A man by the name of Nimrod was the founding father of Babylon, who was a descendant of Ham, who was a son of Noah. Ham was prophesied upon that he would be cursed in his seed, and from this cursed line came Nimrod. Nimrod's name was an indicator of his character. His name meant, we will rebel. Nimrod was a mighty hunter. But his prey was not animals, but it was men. He was a hit man. With his evil influence and cunning words, he influenced men to do his will and his command. It was Nimrod that began the building program on the Tower of the Babel. It was an act of rebellion. Remember the command from God was, I want you to spread out and replenish the earth. And what did the people do? They stayed in one spot. And they said, let's build us a tower that reaches to heaven and let's make a name for ourselves. You know what that sounds like? It sounds like a Nimrod plan. We will rebel and do it our way. We're going to build a tower to get to heaven man's way and we're going to make a name for ourselves while we're doing it. They were filled with pride. That was the beginning of the nation of Babylon and the aggression towards God never died out from Babylon. 
the rebellion continued. We see the aggression towards the people of God continue in the book of Daniel. That was the beginning of Babylon that I just talked to you about, Nimrod and the Tower of Babel. And then we find a king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. Who was Nebuchadnezzar king over? He was king of Babylon. And the same spirit that was in the beginning is still there today. It's still filled with pride and arrogance. And he sent his armies to Jerusalem. He first attacked the house of God and defiled it. He took the vessels from it and later places them with the treasures of his gods. The next step in his plan was to lay hold of the people of God. Anyone here of characters by the name of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? They became captives or prisoners of war underneath the command of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. But why Daniel? Why Shadrach? Why Meshach? And why Abednego? I'll tell you why. Daniel chapter 1, verses 3 through 4 gives the purpose. Nebuchadnezzar chose them among other prime young men. The king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes. Look at this. Children in whom was no blemish, but well favored, skillful in all wisdom, cunning in knowledge and understanding science, uh, and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace, uh, and whom they might teach the learning uh, and tongue of the Chaldeans. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar said, my plan is uh, don't get all of them from Jerusalem, uh, but only bring the best in. Uh, I want the individuals that have no blemish upon them. Uh, I want the individuals that are well favored. Uh, I want those that are skillful in wisdom. Uh, I want those that are cunning in knowledge. Uh, I want those that understand science very well. And he said, I want those that have the ability or know how to stand in king's palaces. Uh, He wanted the best of the best uh, because Nebuchadnezzar understood uh, if you destroy the strong, uh, then the weak will present no problem at all. I've come to tell you today the distractions you are facing uh, is because the spirit uh, of Babylon uh, did not die with Babylon. Uh, The spirit of Babylon is still alive and well today. uh, And it's not going into Jerusalem, uh, but it's coming to Mount Zion, uh, the church of the living God. uh, I tell you what, I'm preaching right to the forces of hell right now. Uh, I'm preaching some lies out of your minds that would be easier out there. Uh, I've come to bring encouragement to you today. Uh, Hell is not interested or Babylon is not interested in weak need, uh, trembling, uh, half-hearted apostolics. Uh, The spirit of Babylon uh, is still standing in opposition to the church today. Uh, And Babylon is not attacking those uh, that are barely holding on uh, and those that are living for God on Sunday uh, but they're not making any efforts the rest of the week to live for God uh, Babylon is not seeking out those uh, who have no potential uh, and no future in the kingdom of God uh, or no anointing upon their life uh, but Babylon is seeking out those uh, who pose the greatest threat to the kingdom uh, of darkness Uh, look into the New Testament Uh, it was the apostle Paul uh, who would write over half of the New Testament Uh, He faced beatings and shipwrecks, and he was left for dead. you want to talk about distractions? Compare your distractions to Paul. Why was Paul attacked like that? It was Babylon attacking the best of the best, those who pose the greatest danger. That's who Babylon attacked. And so I've come to talk to PRC tonight, and I'm fixing to wrap it up, and we'll get into the other things later next week. If you are under attack, attack right now with distractions. It's not because it's the will of God for you to leave. It's because there's a destiny for you in the kingdom of God. It's because there's unfulfilled promise in your life and you're marching towards it and you're getting very close to it. There's people you are teaching Bible studies that are about to be released from the stronghold and the grips of hell. There's neighborhoods you are fixing to touch. There's there's jobs and communities you are involved in that are ready to bust wide open in revival and the enemy is bringing distraction. You know what it is? It's the spirit of Babylon attacking the best of the best. And so 
Some of you are looking at me like you're clueless right now. It means one of two things. You've been distracted for the last 25 minutes while I've been teaching. Or it means you're not the best of the best. It means hell hasn't been distracting you. Or you're so distracted by what the hell has done. You have no fight inside of you. I'm talking to you tonight. If you've been under distractions, understand it's Babylon attacking you. And understand that if Babylon is attacking me, then it's hell's endorsement that I'm doing something right in the kingdom of God. Go ahead, hell. Distract me a little bit longer. It's just going to motivate me that much more. Go ahead. Put something in my mind, hell, and tell me over and over it can't happen. Agitate my mind. It's just to let me know revival's about to break out. The prayers I've been praying, they're about to be answered. Miracles are about to transpire. Signs and wonders, they've been happening, but not alike in the manner they're going to. Thank you, hell, for your, for your endorsement. Thank you, hell, for your confidence. Hell, no, we're not stopping. Hell, yes, we're moving forward. We're motivated. It ought to propel you to do more in the kingdom of God. If you've been under attack with distraction, you ought to stand up right now and say, Babylon, you've attacked long enough and you can keep attacking, but we're not stopping. We are part of the church triumphant. We are the church of the living God. And the church of the living God, it shall stand. It shall stand. I will not be wearied in my mind. I will allow the joy of the Lord to be my strength. I will allow the joy of the Lord to wash over me. And I will be strengthened. And as I walk out those doors today, I shall not be weary, but I've been waiting on the Lord. And I shall renew my strength. I shall mount up with wings as eagles. I shall run and not be weary. Babylon, you've distracted us long enough. We had great revival. We had the prophetic with Brother Campanella. Prayer and fasting changed. And now everybody's weary with distractions. But I'm encouraged tonight. It's hell's endorsement. We're that much closer to the promises of God being fulfilled. You ought to lift your hands and shout to the Lord right now. That's it. Go ahead. It's been here all night, but we've been distracted in our mind and in our spirit. But we understand where the distraction came from. I'm not talking about a self-imposed distraction. I'm talking about a hell-sent spirit of Babylon distraction. But I refuse to bow to the spirit of Babylon. I will not bow down. I will not burn. They can throw me in the fire. But the fourth, the son of like the, like the son of man, he's in the fire with me. And there's a great revival on the other end. For when Shadrach, Meshach, and Rebendigo came out, the king, Nebuchadnezzar, said, There's no God like their God. Go ahead, Babylon. Throw me in the fire. Everybody's watching me that I've been talking to about the things of God. And we're going to come out on the other side. And they shall state there is only one God. Oh, lift your hands and give him praise right now. If you've been under distraction, you ought to be encouraged. You ought to be encouraged. You're on the right path. Keep praying. Keep fasting. Keep seeking God. Be not weary and well doing in due season. We shall reap if we faint not. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Would every hand in the house be lifted, every head lifted towards heaven? And would you give him great praise and glory right now? Hallelujah, hallelujah. Shakara bokor la baka la baka. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus, a supernatural strength and determination will come into the heart and mind of every individual. I silence the lies of the enemy in the name of Jesus. I silence the distractions in the name of Jesus. We shall prevail in the name of the Lord. Oh, someone pray in the Holy Ghost right now.
Listen to me very quickly as I close out. I'm going to hop way ahead. We'll finish up the rest of this next week. But I've got to hop to one of my closing points for you to have a takeaway as you walk out of here. Because I know you're encouraged right now, but tomorrow morning when you wake up and the agitation of the mind is going, what do you do? So my closing, I gave five things to do to deal with the distraction. I'm not giving those tonight. I'm giving you one of them. We'll cover all the rest next week if we finish this. Everyone say ignore. Ignore and persist. Say persist. Nehemiah is rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. He faced distractions. Someone come help me on music to give them hope, please. He faced distractions. There was purpose behind the distraction. It was to halt the building of the wall. Nehemiah faced distraction from without. There was a guy by the name of Sanballat, Tobiah, and a group of Samaritans that mocked them. They would get right up to them while they were building that wall, and they would make jokes. They would say, ha, even a foss could tear down that wall. Seriously, guys? Read your Bible. It's in there. Now look what Nehemiah did. He didn't stop and say, oh, no, I'm using two by sixes and six by twelves and the he did not even have a conversation with them. He ignored it. Talked to the hand. He ignored it. And he kept building. If the enemy can't get you through one avenue of distraction, he'll get you through a second avenue of distraction. But then many realized I can't get them with distraction from without. He got bickering among the people. And that's harder than the distraction from without. And when the bickering was going on, Nehemiah had to pause and unite the people. And they continued working. And so if you're distracted from without, ignore it and keep building. If you're distracted from within, pause, work the difference out. That's Bible. Go to the person individually, work it out. If that doesn't work, get two or three. If that doesn't work, bring it before the church and work it out. Pause, work it out, and then keep building. So when distractions come, if it's from without, ignore it and persist. The word persist means to keep working in the face of opposition. So when the enemy distracts from without, ignore it and just keep going. When he distracts from within, he gets your brother or your sister or not against you. Work it out. Get united again. And once you work it out, don't go back to it. Unity is more than a one-time deal. One of the ingredients in unity and the anointing oil that unity is likened unto was a preservative, which means it has to be preserved. If there's going to be unity in the church, you've got to work at it. And working at it is not the pastor preaching about it. It's you examining yourself. And if you have odd against a brother or against a sister, it's not a one and done. You keep, you keep interacting until you get that all the way out of you. And then you persist. You keep on working in the face of opposition. Hell, Spirit of Babylon, thank you for your endorsement on Phoenix Revival Center. And all the distractions you've given the last week, we're going to do two things, three things. We're going to ignore it and keep working. And if it's from within, we're going to work it out and keep working. Be encouraged tonight if hell's been distracting you. You're on the path to something great in the kingdom of God. Would you lift your hands and love the Lord all over this house? Uh, I love you and I bless you and I praise your name, Jesus. Uh, I thank you for the word of God. I thank you for the spirit of God. Uh, thank you for coming in and helping us tonight. I bless you and I praise your name. Uh, I love you, Jesus. I bless you and I praise you and I thank you, oh God. Uh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Uh, 
God, I pray a special strength upon your people. Uh, hell has been distracting us, but every time a distraction comes, uh, let the word of God that we've shared tonight come as a reminder uh, that it's an endorsement from hell that they're doing the right thing and to keep persisting, uh, to ignore the distractions, to work it out with them if it's from within, uh, and keep going forward in the name of Jesus. Uh, we want to see your harvest. We want to see the suddenly uh, and your desires come to pass, and we give you glory and honor and praise in Jesus' name. Uh, would you give the Lord praise and glory right now? I love you, and I bless you, and I worship your name. Uh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Uh, God bless you tonight. We'll see you in the house of the Lord this weekend. We'll pick up next Wednesday night on what to do with distractions. God bless you.